we'll go ahead and get started. So today's agenda, I'm um, gonna do introductions which have already taken place. Uh, we'll do a quick safety share. Um, this is something that if you haven't been on an FMC um, you know, presentation previously, um, it's something that we do for every talk. Um, it's a little um, reminder on safety. And we'll talk a little about ant morphology, you know, some of those components of an ant that uh, help us identify them, uh, some key uh, or common ants uh, and their key characteristics. Then a little bit on ant management as well, whether it's baiting, uh, habitat modification, uh, liquids or granular type applications, you know, things like that. So real quick on, on safety, um, you know, this winter, uh, we've had some really good cold spells come through. So this is on winter um, car care or checklist. So make sure that, you know, your battery is in good working uh, condition. You don't want to get stuck somewhere and be broken down. Um, so make sure those battery cables and terminals are all clean and, and uh, in good working condition. You know, the hoses of the engine, make sure those are, you know, not cracked or going to, you know, fail on you. So have those checked out, um, you know, uh, I'd say early in the season, just to make sure you'll get through the winter with those. Uh, your tires and, and tread, make sure you do have them inflated properly. And the inflation uh, for the tire, you know, what they should be at is really inside the um, driver's side door. Uh, there's a sticker there that tells you how they should be inflated. Um, and also check the tread, make sure that they have good, uh, good tread on them so you don't slide all over the road in, in uh, icy or, or snowy conditions. Wiper blades, uh, again, they should be in good working uh, order. I remember when I used to live up in New Jersey, um, all that salt would fly up on the, on the car um, and you needed your wipers to work really well. Uh, full washer fluid as well. Um, also have a good emergency road kit. Um, this is something that you know, you want to make sure you have, you know, obviously a first aid kit in there, or maybe some flares or something you can put on the road in case you do break down. Um, maybe some sand or salt to help you get traction. Uh, a little foldable snow shovel may be a good idea to keep in that kit as well. Um, a, a phone charger is also a good idea. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I like to have as well um, is like uh, this guy over here. This is a small, um, really it's a jumper uh, for your car in case you do get stuck where the car won't start. Um, if you have this thing charged uh, and leave it in your car, this can help you jumpstart your vehicle. Um, it's also a, a power source. So you can plug into this, you know, to charge your cell phone if you ever get stuck. Um, you could also potentially even have a small portable heater in your, your safety kit. You can plug into this and it'll run it for several hours um, if need be um, to keep yourself warm. Uh, but also in this kit, you know, make sure you do have those things like, um, you know, extra clothes, a blanket, maybe some water, uh, some food as well. There were a lot of stories with this last uh, Arctic blast that came through, people got stuck in their cars. Um, and then they were stuck for, for hours, you know, 12, 16 hours, things like that. So one story where someone actually had to break into a school to shelter people, um, you know, don't recommend been doing that, but you know, in extreme conditions, you know, you got to do what you have to do. And they actually commended that gentleman for getting people into that school. But you know, again, if you have some of these things like the supplies, the water, the food, the blankets, maybe one of these power packs, uh, you know, a small little heater, um, it could help you maybe uh, avoid those kind of uh, extreme measures. So that's the quick safety share. Hopefully that does help you all out and remind you to, hey, check, see what you have in your vehicle and uh, make sure you have uh, some of these necessities. So moving on to, uh, to ants, you know, and just like any other pest, you know, identification is really the key to control. So kind of knowing what ant you're dealing with can really help you um, gain a better uh, control of that ant. So looking at some of the common features, you know, uh, they do have a narrow waist or, or pedicel. Uh, there are three segmented bodies, you know, just like all of your insects. Uh, they could have one or two nodes, um, you know, between the uh, abdomen and thorax. Uh, they do have elbowed antennae. Um, and the adults that do swarm, you know, do have four wings. Uh, the front are longer or larger than the rear wings. Uh, the elbowed antenna, you know, could be important because if you see something with straight antennae, say they have four wings, all the same length, I think most of us uh, probably would know uh, maybe a termite, you know, not an ant. So uh, again, knowing some of these characteristics can help. Um, just an overview of some of the, uh, the body parts of an ant. 
So you have your, your head region up here, your thorax, your abdomen. Uh, on the head, you know, you have things like antennas, the eyes, the mandibles, uh, the thorax, you know, you could have thoracic spines there. Uh, your legs are attached there as well. You could have things like sphericals, which are for breathing and uh, gas exchange. Uh, the abdomen, you, know, you have the petiole, uh, which has nodes. Uh, you have the gaster as well. And kind of if you look at an ant, uh, maybe you didn't think about this, but really the thorax is kind of like the powerhouse of the ant. So here is where you have the legs attached. It's also where you would have any wings attached. So really, you know, get, it's that powerhouse to move that uh, ant around. Um, you start to look at the abdomen. Um, this is really reproductive uh, portions and um, uh, and also where they, you know, excrete waste, things like that. But uh, so again, powerhouse is really the center portion um, of the ant. And then up here is really where you have um, really the, the uh, some sensory you know, organs, your antenna, your, your mouth parts, eyes, things like that. Some more of the sensory uh, areas. Again, to look at this in a little bit different way, um, again, just splitting it up, you know, uh, some of the key things you would wanna look at, the antennae. So with the antenna of the ant, you, know, you can look at that, you, you can count the sections. Um, is, is there a club on the antenna? Um, looking at the scape, the size of it. Um, you can sometimes be diagnostic on which ant you're dealing with. Or thorax, you know, is it evenly rounded or smooth? Um, are there hairs present or spines, things like that? Uh, the number of, you know, nodes uh, that the ant has, that can also help you identify it. And then looking at the abdomen, you look at things like, you know, um, hairs, you know, the, the shape. Um, you know, do they raise the abdomen or not, you know, when they're, when they're moving around? So lots of different little ways you can, you can use some of these characteristics to identify um, the ant. Uh, we talked about the antenna a little bit, so not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but you'll see when I go over some of these uh, common ants, we'll talk about the number of segments. Now, you really can't see that with the naked eye. Uh, if you can, you have a lot better eyesight than I do, and you're probably a lot younger than me. Um, but you will need some type of a magnifier, you know, whether it's a, uh, a hand lens or, or a microscope. Uh, the good thing is you can get a, a microscope these days that are pretty inexpensive. Some of them you can hook right up to your cell phone or to your computer. Uh, you can snap images from them as well. I kind of have an old school one. Um, that's just a regular light microscope. Uh, you look through the, the, the top, through the eyepiece, um, down onto a, a, a lighted platform. Um, and I can actually take pictures in that using my iPhones by sticking the camera over those eyepieces. Um, and if you get a good photo, you can send those in to you know, either your extension agents from local universities. Uh, I've had folks send some samples to me, that's fine. I'll be glad to take a look and see if I can ID something for you. But it's just a good way to have, you know, if you have a hand lens or a microscope, um, it's gonna help you um, identify what, what species you're, you're dealing with. So, you know, some other ways of, you know, kind of not, they're not diagnostic, but you're know, putting a lot of these things together can help you identify what species you're looking at. Um, you know, so the size of the ants, you know, are they small, very small, medium or large, you know, are they all the same size, all the workers in the colony? So are they monomorphic, are they polymorphic? So different size workers, you know, in that uh, colony. Habits, you know, indoor or outdoor, you know, where are you finding the majority of these ants, you know, and um, colony structure, you know, single queen, multiple queen colonies. This may be hard to tell, you know, if you're just seeing a little bit of trailing or some other things, but if you can find, you know, a nest site, um, you may be able to just uh, determine that. You know, are they nesting in the soil above ground, below ground, you know, both? You know, are they nesting inside the home? Behavior, do they sting? So uh, do they have a strong trailing uh, behavior? So are you seeing you know, strong trails of ants or are you seeing somehow just individually? Um, that can help you determine you know, uh, what species you're looking at. Um, I actually had the, uh, the opportunity to go and visit the Amazon um, recently and we came across uh, bull ants and our guide would say, oh, that's a bull ant. I'm like, how do you know? You're looking at it from you know, 10 feet away. Um, it's because they go out on their own. They forage on their own because they're strong enough to um, survive on their own. Nothing's going to mess with them. So they'll just go out solo and, you know, find other insects to bring back to the colony. So that was kind of how he was saying, you know, that, that's what they are. And then the size are absolutely huge too. So 
um, geography. So where are they found? You know, if you're up in you know Maine and you have a mounding ant out in the yard, you know, probably not going to be a fire ant. Probably something else. But um, again, you know, that geography. Where where do you live? You know, where are you seeing the ants? Um, then the reproductive habits. You know, do they swarm? Are they sending out you know tons of reproductive you know, swarming? Are they using fission or budding um, to split up that colony? Um, you know, some different behaviors that can help you, again, key in on um, what species you may be dealing with. So now, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit. So looking at some, some common ants here. Um, this one is the acrobat ant. I'm not going to read through all the, all the type um, over to the left, but really looking at this heart or, or spade-shaped um, uh, abdomen. Uh, that's kind of diagnostic for this guy. Um, also, if you can see right side of the circle, I know it's hard to see in this photo, there's a spine here and a spine over here. So there's two spines you know, on the thorax. Uh, but these guys, what they'll do when they walk around, they'll actually lift that abdomen up in the air and kind of hold it up there. Uh, so that's sort of, again, a, a little characteristic of this guy. Um, they are about an eighth of an inch in size. Um, they do have the two nodes. Um, they do nest in um, you know, soil, um, in wood. They'll get into styrofoam insulation. Uh, these guys will kick out, you know, a lot of frass, uh, similar to what carpenter ants will do. So I've seen them actually get into uh, loose mortar joints around chimneys, up in attic areas, things like that. Um, so they'll kick out some of that same, um, you know, frass and debris that, uh, that carpenter ants do. Um, they're fairly strong trailers. Um, and typically there's a shiny uh, black coloration, but they can have uh, red as well on them. Uh, they do like sweets and proteins. So they do like... Um, you know, honeydew from honeydew producers, and then they'll also feed on, you know, other insects and things like that. But really that heart-shaped or, or spade-shaped abdomen is, is kind of diagnostic. Um, and these guys are active in the north um, uh, and really throughout the U.S., uh, but uh, down south, you know, treatment maybe all year long, uh, up north, maybe uh, spring throughout the summer into the fall. Um, Argentina, this guy is kind of a dull brown ant. So, um, you know, just kind of this Average looking at, I guess you would say, uh, they're about an eighth of an inch long. They do have a, a musty odor uh, when crushed. Uh, they are all the same size. So if you're looking at this colony, they're, they're all gonna be a similar size. Um, they can um, develop into huge colonies. Uh, I think I've seen published where there was a colony of these guys, and it's really a cooperative colony of a lot of different queens uh, and lots of workers you know, that could stretch from San Francisco to San Diego and all communicating. So this one is a, a, a large colony ant for sure. Um, they can nest under any kind of debris outside, you know, firewood, mulch. Um, they're non-combative, as I said, in separate colonies and they can act as a large you know, super colony. Um, and these guys are really found um, throughout the U.S., uh, a lot of them out west, you know, down in Florida as well, but even, you know, a little bit of the, uh, the mid-Atlantic. Uh, and then Arizona, up to the Pacific Northwest as well, and out to Hawaii. Um, they do like uh, sweets, so they do like to tend those honeydew producers, so those aphids, mealybugs, things like that, uh, scale insects on plants, uh, but they will take proteins as well. And the reason why the diet is important for a lot of these ants, um, if you're thinking about baiting them, you know, what kind of bait are you going to use, right? So are you going to use a sweet bait for something that's more of a protein um, uh, taker? Uh, now, a lot of these ants do take both, but that could also depend on the time of year. So if you use a sweet bait for an ant that maybe takes sweets and protein, then it's not working, switch it up to a protein. Um, again, it just may be that time of year uh, where they take one versus the other. Um, these guys do have a 12-segmented um, a antenna, and treatment for these guys um, pretty much you know, throughout the year uh, where they're found. Uh, again, being these super large colonies, one way to help control them is to help to control some of those honeydew producers that they might be feeding on. So if you have a lot of shrubs around the structure, and this is true for a lot of the ants, um, if they're feeding off the honeydew from those you know, aphids and, and other uh, pests on those plants, control those, and then you can in turn maybe reduce the population of uh, some of these sweet feeding ants. Uh, big headed ant. Um, this one's kind of like what it says, you know, they have this larger worker form with a, with a very large uh, head. So pretty simple to see when you're, you're viewing these guys. 
Uh, they do have major and minor workers, so they do have uh, different uh, size workers in the colony, uh, anywhere from a 16th to an eighth, maybe even a quarter inch in size. Uh, they do like to nest in soil. They do leave distinct piles of soil along sidewalks, you know, in lawns and flower beds, things like that. Um, so New York to New, New England, uh, South Florida, Florida to Arizona. So they are pretty widespread as well. These guys like more high protein foods. Uh, they have a 12 segmented antenna with a three segmented club. And they do have a short um, uh, pair of short spines on the waist facing almost directly upward. So again, some ways you can help identify these guys. Uh, a treatment, you know, year round in warmer climates and uh, warmer months up in the colder climates. Uh, carpenter ants, um, you know, there are a couple different species of carpenter ants. Um, this one is uh, Pensamanicus in the picture. So, you know, usually a dark black in color. The Florida carpenter ant does have a red uh, thorax, so uh, they can be, you know, all black to black and red. Uh, these guys are pretty large in size, usually anywhere from three eighths to a half an inch in size. Uh, they do like to forage uh, in the evening, uh, so you can actually go out and follow uh, foraging trails. Uh, in, in the evening time into the nighttime. Uh, they do like to nest in rotting or damp wood. You know, they'll get into wall voids, foam insulation that they'll excavate out. Um, you can look for those piles of frass, kind of like we talked about with the acrobat ant. Um, that's where they're excavating out some of those um, chambers to nest in. Uh, they don't actually eat the wood like a termite does. They'll actually just excavate it out. And again, they like you know, soft or you know, decaying or, or maybe um, moisture uh, damaged wood, uh, typically, you know, good solid piece of wood that's kind of got a low moisture content, um, maybe not get into, but again, they'll nest in curtain rods, you know, again, those wall voids, they don't need to actually just excavate wood. Um, these species are found throughout the US, they do feed on both sweets and proteins, uh, and they have a very evenly rounded thorax. So up in here, that's usually pretty evenly rounded, there's not a lot of ridging to it or, um, uh, you know, different uh, levels to it. it it's very even. Uh, they also have a single node that's pretty prominent right here uh, on the abdomen. Uh, they do have a lot of hairs on the abdomen and they do usually have a ring of hairs right at the tip of the abdomen as well. So um, pretty diagnostic for these guys. Um, let's see, uh, application timing again in the north, it's, it's in the spring and summer. Uh, south could be all year long. And with these guys, typically the main colony is outside. So if you know you're dealing with carpenter ants, you can eliminate that main colony on the exterior. A lot of times that'll solve some of the interior problems you're having as well, because those are typically satellite colonies inside that do maintain contact with exterior colonies. So uh, finding that exterior colony is, is pretty important and they do trail pretty distinctively. So in the evening, you can follow some of those trails back, maybe to an old stump or some railroad ties or other you know, landscape materials. Uh, take care of that, and you can take care of a pretty large portion of this colony. Uh, the crazy ant, or tawny crazy ant, uh, this one formerly known as Caribbean crazy ant, kind of a golden brown, reddish brown, uh, pretty small in size, a single noted ant. Uh, they have a smooth, uh, glossy body. Uh, when they feed, uh, the abdomen does fill up, especially if they're feeding on honeydew. It may look striped as it kind of enlarges, and that's this portion here. Um, just as it stretches out, you know, you'll see some of those uh, seams that are between the different plates. Um, so it may actually look like it's striped, uh, but it's, it's really not. Um, they do nest under just about anything. Uh, these guys, you know, I saw them when I was down in the uh, Houston area in Texas, and there can be just millions and millions, even into the billions of ants per acre. Uh, and they will feed on just about anything that's there, uh, whether it's, you know, aphids or honeydew producers, to other insects, to they've been known to um, feed on birds and nests, so the chicks that have just hatched. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you have a big infestation of these, uh, the surrounding area is eerily quiet, is what I noticed. Um, you know, there's nothing chirping, there's not other insects around. These guys will clean everything up and kind of move on, including fire ants, they'll attack them as well. Um, so, really, these are the Florida. Um, Florida along the Texas, along the Gulf Coast, and probably spreading even a little bit more. Uh, they have a uh, antenna with 12 segments, uh, no club. Uh, the scape is nearly twice the width of the head. Um, these guys probably require more of an area-wide control. Like if you just have one home in a neighborhood, 
um, you're trying to control these, uh, it can be very, very difficult. Uh, but combinations of baits, perimeter sprays, um, and, and really getting rid of some of those uh, honeydew producers and really cleaning up anything in the yard that they could potentially nest under. And that can be just a piece of wood, um, any kind of a flower pot, anything like that they'll nest in. So very difficult one to control um, if you ever had to deal with it. Uh, ghost ant, uh, these guys, you know, the head and thorax are deep, you know, dark brown to blackish color. They're very, very small, about a 16th of an inch, but they do kind of have this uh, opaque or milky white um, um, gaster and leg area. Uh, so a very, very small ant. Um, they do trail pretty well, so you can, you can kind of follow trails, these guys, but they will nest pretty much anywhere as well. Uh, I've battled with these guys inside my own home, and you, know, you can definitely, uh, I would say baiting for these is, is number one. Uh, if you spray, sometimes these colonies do tend to split up and you could actually have multiple colonies inside a home. Um, they love to nest, you know, under baseboards, around door trim, uh, under your tile on the floor. Uh, if it's not sealed down really well, uh, if you have any kind of missing grout, you'll get into those cracks and crevices and nest under the tile. Uh, these guys are, you know, Florida, Hawaii, the Midwest, the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic and Gulf Coast. So pretty widespread as well. Uh, and can be kind of a pain to uh, to, to really treat and and, uh, and get rid of. But baiting is really, I think, the key with these guys. And you may have to switch up baits from time to time. Uh, these are like sweet sound proteins, 12-segmented uh, antenna um, with the uh, segment thickening towards the tip. Uh, application timing, again, I, I would actually bait for these first. Uh, maybe on the outside you can spray, but if they're indoors, definitely I would say bait. A couple more ants, and then we'll get into some of the control stuff. So um, the uh, large yellow ant or citronella ant, uh, these guys, you know, I love some of the names sometimes, but um, it's really a large yellow ant. Um, medium sized, about a quarter inch, uh, can be a little bit larger with the, the reproductives. Uh, these guys smell like citronella or lemon uh, when crushed. They are a single node ant, and pretty much all the workers the same size. Uh, they like to nest. Uh, in the soil, you know, under rocks, under logs, porches, patios, slabs, things like that. Um, if you're in the Northeast uh, or Eastern US, you're familiar with this guy. Um, and uh, they do forage, you know, underground. Uh, so that may be difficult to locate some of these colonies, but a lot of times if you pick up a log or something they're nesting under, you'll kind of see those bright kind of yellow or orange ants under there and you'll know what they are. Uh, they do tend to aphids uh, for nectar. Um, that's sort of their, their main food source. Uh, they do have a 12 segmented antennae. Um, uh, the scape uh, just reaches the top of the head. Uh, they have an uneven thorax as well. And these guys, you know, can be treated, you know, uh, you know in the warmer months in, in the uh, north, um, down south, potentially all year long. Little black ant, um, again, another great name. Uh, so it's a small, uh, dark brown, the black ant, about a 16th of an inch. Uh, this is a two node ant. Uh, one thing I didn't mention before, but um, most of the ants with, with two nodes uh, are the ones that are going to have really a stinger or really potentially be able to sting you. Single node ants, uh, I, you know, from what I've seen, uh, typically don't, uh, don't have that. Uh, so really it's the two node ants that can potentially sting. Um, and you'll see with fire ants in a little bit, you know, they are two node ant as well. So it makes sense. Uh, these guys like the nest. Um, in wall voids, you know, under carpets, you know, in woodwork, decaying wood, and masonry. Um, you know, they like to forage, you know, along edges, just like a lot of other ants. Uh, they're found throughout the United States, but most often in the East, and they do eat both sweet and protein. Uh, 12 segmented antenna with a three segmented club. Odorous house ant, uh, dark brown to brownish black in color, 16th to an eighth of an inch. Again, a strong trailer, uh, single node, Pretty much all the same size workers. Um, these guys can forage even down to temperatures of about 50 degrees or so. So if it's a little bit cooler out and you're seeing some foraging ants around, um, could potentially be this guy. Um, let's see, I like to nest in a wide variety of places outdoors and inside, uh, shallow nests in soil, um, areas with moisture such as around hot water pipes or heaters inside, uh, and they could have multiple queens as well. They tend to aphids uh, for honeydew, uh, but do prefer, you know, dead insects, uh, uh, sweets, and or uh, proteins. So they do have a, a single flattened uh, petiole node. Uh, they have a bitter odor when crushed. Uh, people say it smells like rotten coconut. 
Um, but yeah, so you, you can get that that kind of just distinct uh, smell if you do you know, smash one of these guys. Um, Dave Manant, uh, this guy, if you're again, um, if you've seen these, you kind of know kind of know what they look like. But uh, they're about an eighth inch. They are two nodes, uh, single worker size. Uh, they love the nest along sidewalks and foundations of buildings, uh, under stones, brick, mulch, etc. Um, they like to eat, you know, um, your protein. So dead insects, greasy foods. They will take sweets as well. Um, key identifiers is really on the, on the, the head itself. They have these longitudinal uh, grooves or, or ridges, I guess. So pretty diagnostic with this one. If you get that under a scope and just take a look at the head, you'll see these ridges there. Um, and again, they could be uh, active throughout the year uh, in the south and in the north, obviously in the warmer months. Barrow ant, um, yellow with kind of a reddish coloration on the abdomen. These guys are really small. Uh, about a 16th of an inch in size. Uh, now throughout the U.S., you know, up north, uh, they love to get indoors and, and they're kind of a pest uh, in, in hospitals or medical facilities. Uh, they will get into actually wounds on patients and start feeding there as well. So um, it is something that, uh, you know, definitely in, in those types of situations, uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, they're not there and that we can control them. Um, they do like uh, uh, greases or fats and oils. Uh, they may switch away from baits. Um, so with this one, you know, you don't really want to spray for, for farrow ants. Uh, farrow ants, you got to bait for them. That's kind of been the, uh, the common uh, thought throughout the years, and, and it still holds true. Um, if you start spraying for farrow ants, what can happen is uh, those colonies can split. And now instead of having, you know, a few, maybe you have a bunch of colonies now that you're dealing with. So really baiting is, is the way to go with this one. Um, and really, you know, all year round indoors if, if you're seeing this guy. Uh, the rover ant, uh, dark brown to pale blonde in color. Uh, this is one I, I, I was out in Texas, you know, 10, 12 years ago, lived out there for several years and started seeing this guy. Um, you know, it is sometimes uh, mistaken for little black ant or farrow ant. It's a strong trailing ant. Um, they are happy to come indoors, especially when there's any kind of, you know, plumbing uh, or moisture issues. Um, you know, uh, these guys can be from you know, the Gulf Coast, you know, Florida, to Texas, to California. I saw them out in Palm Desert uh, when I was out there. Uh, these are like sweets. So that's kind of one of their preferred food sources. So baits with sweets is good, especially on the inside. Um, outdoors, yeah, there are some treatment programs you can do outside, you know, with residual sprays. Um, but one of the key identifiers, this has a nine segmented club or antenna. And this is diagnostic for this ant. So if you can get under the scope and look at it, you can kind of tell what it is sometimes they also call this the pool ant because they do swarm around swimming pools uh, a lot especially down in florida where we have a lot of pools and you get tons of um, swarming ants you know in the pools and uh, just drives people nuts so they do call this a pool ant as well down there uh, fire ant um, red to dark brown in color there's, there's several species of this um, red imported black imported tropical fire ant southern fire ant um, and really found throughout the southern states. Uh, this one is moving you know, further and further north, it seems like every year. I uh, don't know how well they can establish above anywhere that gets a good hard freeze, but uh, they tend to be moving more and more north. Um, these guys will eat plant and animal matter. Uh, they do prefer those high protein foods. So uh, other insects, uh, you know, they'll attack, you know, uh, hatching uh, chicks, uh, even calves uh, that are you know, born out in the field. Uh, they've been known to kill uh, by just getting all around the mouth nose of, of a newborn calf and it's really suffocating it but they definitely will feed on anything they can get a hold of and they do have a very painful sting they are a public health pest um, and for the i guess the wrong person uh, if you get into these guys uh, could cause uh, anaphylactic shock uh, an allergic reaction so again really uh, key uh, pest in the south and, you know, there's a lot of different ways to treat for them. Uh, there's baiting for these guys. There's mound treatments. There's area-wide treatment as well with residuals. And really combinations of all those tend to work pretty well. Uh, White-footed ant. Uh, these guys, dark brown to black with light color, you know, tarsi or, or feet. Um, these guys do like to uh, uh, feed on uh, honeydew producers and really, you know, not a 
a hugely widespread ant, but one that can be out, you know, in the in the foliage that you may come across. Um, and really, with this one, reduce the honeydew uh, secretors, you know, on those plants, and you can reduce this ant um, pretty dramatically. Uh, one thing I will say, you know, if you don't have, you make sure your licensing does allow you to treat, uh, you know, ornamentals. If you're treating for some of these honeydew producing pests, sometimes if those shrubs are within 10 feet of the structure, you're covered with a pest control license, sometimes you're not. So just make sure you know, um, that you are covered uh, under your proper licensing. So that was real quick through you know, several different species of ants you may come into contact with. Um, you know, if you're unsure of what you're seeing, uh, you can definitely uh, grab a sample of an ant. You know, people have asked, you, how do I do that? You, know, you can get one of these little vials you know, uh, or any, any little container, you get a little bit of 70% alcohol solution grab a sample, throw it in there, and um, you're good to go. Uh, get that off to your, again, your local extension agent, or if you have an entomologist on staff, you know, obviously they can, they can look at that as well. Um, you can also use a Ziploc bag for samples. If you're gonna mail those to somebody though, a lot of times they get dried out and kind of crack and break apart, you know, in shipping. So not always the best thing to do. Um, but if you also get a high resolution picture, and email it, you know, sometimes you can tell from that, but again, it's got to be a good quality photo, you know, under a scope where we can see some of these characteristics. So um, a little bit on ant management uh, inspection, you know, as with really a lot of other pests, really the most important part. If you can identify the problem, a lot of times you can uh, come up with a really good solution. Um, find resource sites. So go around, inspect around that property, look for the things that ants want. So food, shelter, water, um, harborage. Um, Look for entry points, uh, look for areas that need modification. Um, and inspections are really ongoing. You know, they, they, it's not just you do it the first time you're there, you got them on a monthly or quarterly schedule and you never inspect again. Uh, so make sure you do keep that up. And all these will help you determine your course of action you know, moving forward. So ant management strategies, you know, locate and treat existing colonies, Conti continu uh, continuation of the inspection process, um, treat the colonies, you know, you can use, you know, baits, um, you can use liquid products, granular products, dust, aerosols. Uh, so some baiting tips, you know, place baits on or near foraging trails. This is something that, you know, some ant species, they don't like if you place the bait right on the trail. So I, what I like to do if you're baiting, put it right next to foraging trails. Um, you know, I kind of liken it to, you know, letting the ants find it for themselves, even though you're kind of putting it right next to them, as opposed to just dropping it right on their trail. Because if you drop it right on the trail, what can happen is there's pheromones there, there's trailing, you know, trailing pheromones that you can disrupt by doing that. Um, and then, you know, you don't want the ants giving off some alarm, like, oh goodness, something's happening here that we don't want. Or if you put it just beside the trail, they'll kind of make their way, you know, they don't follow the trails 100%, they're kind of moving back and forth along them. So maybe they'll run into it. And that way they found it on their own and they're not saying, wow, how did this get here? It's like, wow, look what we found. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, you know, use enough bait, you know, place in multiple locations, you know, small amounts. Um, this is important as well. You know, and I think about it like this, where, you know, if you put a bait out there, they start taking that bait up, they're taking it back to the nest. Um, let's say, you know, they're getting enough of that bait where maybe not some of these ants aren't making it back. And they're dying, you know, midway or, or you know along the way. Um, they may give off an alarm as well and say, "Hey, avoid that food source, you know, and cut that that bait placement off, if you will." So if you have multiple bait placements near different foraging trails, now you've increased number of ants that are really contacting that bait and taking it back to the colony. So if it is acting a little quick for whatever reason, um, at least you've introduced more ants to it than just that single placement. So hopefully, again, that makes sense. Uh, monitor the activity frequently, you know, are they avoiding the bait for some reason, you know, are they continuously feeding on it? Um, yeah, so just make sure you keep an eye on that. Um, match your bait formulation and size, you know, to the target ant. So if these are really small little ants and you're putting out large granular bait, maybe not the best option, right? So maybe use a liquid, um, you know, if you're using, you know, gels or things like that, maybe a little bit smaller placements, just depending on um, the size or if they're, you know, just knocking the heck out of those bait placements, but a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> kind of a, a little bit of a graphic here, but you know, these ants are trailing up the side of this, this home, obviously going in through a crack in the stucco. Um, but really, you know, put your bait placements you know, next to the trails. Don't just 
plop it right on the trail here where you're disturbing that, that foraging behavior. Uh, let them find it on their own, kind of like we already talked about a little bit. Uh, again, you just don't want to you know, drop something in as a surprise on them. Um, let them find it and say, wow, look what we found and be happy and take it back with them. So, you know, carpenter ant bait, you know, if you're baiting for carpenter ants and, you know, it's be being eaten by other species of ants, you're, you're, you're kind of wondering what to do. Maybe bait towards the evening when the ants are, carpenter ants are more active, the other ants maybe are not. Um, you know, create a buffet, you know, of bait. You don't have to just use one. There's nothing that says you can only use this liquid bait or this gel bait or this granular bait. You know, use a little bit of a buffet, you know, some proteins, some sweets, some maybe liquids, gels, or, or granular. You can use a variety of different baits if you're if you're having issues. Um, you know, two little bait put out for a large colony. Uh, I once went out with a customer. They had liquid bait out every I think it was six feet around the structure, and they, the ants were just cleaning it out. So they kept you know putting more and more out. You know, uh, it was a large colony of ants, obviously, but um, it took a lot of bait. <laughs> so some of these colonies can take quite a bit. Uh, hopefully that shouldn't last very long as they're taking a lot of that bait back. Uh, they should be hopefully reducing the numbers, but, you know, again, don't be afraid to put a little bit more out or, or a few more placements out uh, to help you. Um, other things, so they don't feed on the bait, right? So it could be, you know, odor from, you know, cigarettes or tobacco fuel, you know, maybe you just fuel up the truck and then you put out a bait, you got a little bit of fuel residue on your hand, you know, colognes, perfumes, things like that. Uh, baits placed too far from the foraging trail. Uh, baits were stored maybe imp improperly with uh, pesticides nearby, or maybe the bait is you know dried out or, or too old. So all things to kind of look at, um, you know, as far as you know why they're not feeding on it. And it could also be that again, maybe it's a sweet bait they want protein. Maybe it's the opposite. Uh, maybe it's not the right you know form of bait for that ant. You know, maybe they, they just want a liquid bait instead of a, a granular bait. Uh, so again, you know, look for, you know, reasons why, you know, it, it may not be working for you. That's kind of it on, on baiting. Again, just touched on a little bit. Um, you're looking at, you know, liquid applications, you know, around the perimeter. Um, again, you know, you guys have been doing this probably for many years, you know, treating along, you know, the foundation, uh, you know, a couple feet up, you know, maybe up to 10 feet out. Uh, and then some key areas around windows or anywhere there's kind of openings where they can get in. Um, one thing I'll say though, you know, it, it, a lot of times you look at a product and you say, okay, it's, it's an ounce per gallon of water, you mix it up and you go spray. But also take a look at, you know, how much product does the label say to put out per thousand square feet? Because really that's where, you know, a lot of the data on products, or that's how a lot of the data on the products is, is actually derived. Um, it's not about mixing up a 0.06% and just going out and spraying. It's about putting out one ounce of product per X number of square feet. Um, so that's really how the, the, the uh, efficacy data is, is, um, uh, is produced. So, you know, look at that, you know, does your product say put out an ounce of product per thousand square feet? Um, think about your volumes of water going out. So you can put that one ounce in two gallons, up to 10 gallons or even one gallon, but make sure you're covering a thousand square feet with it. Um, that way you're getting the most possible out there uh, and really the best possible chance of, of gaining control, uh, especially, you know, higher volumes. If you have, you know, dense vegetation or mulch that you're treating over and around, uh, a little bit more volume is good. Still putting out the same amount of active per area, but just doing a little bit more water uh, is important. Get your better penetration through, you know, some of that dense vegetation. Um, so again, you know, you can use power sprays, BNGs, backpack, you know, make those thorough applications. Uh, vertical surfaces, you know, up to a couple feet and then select areas above, you know, as, as per the label. So always look at your labels as well. Make sure this is what it says. There are some products this will be a little bit different on. Um, and then, you know, applying to, you know, edges, um, other linear structures, uh, you know, on that, on other linear surfaces on that structure as well. So under windowsills, things like that is important. Uh, horizontal surfaces, so you know maybe seven to seven to ten feet away from the structure. Um, you know most labels do allow that. I can tell you there are some revisions to labels that EPA wants to get out very soon, which is going to limit that to I think seven feet now. You know going forward, but again those aren't out yet. I would say in the next year or so, you'll probably see some changes like that. 
Um, if there's heavy mulch or, or other you know, thatch or debris up against the foundation, um, I like to rake it back a little bit, treat, put it back over, maybe go back over the top uh, because you wanna get some of that treatment down further through those uh, mulchy areas. And then again, treat the ornamental plants for honeydew producing insects. But again, make sure that your licensing does allow you to do that. Um, follow and treat ant trails and nests. Uh, obviously, you know, here's a, you know, just a quick little, you know, mound from an ant colony. So you know where that is. You can treat that fairly easily. Over here to the right, you've got debris sitting on the ground, um, potentially ants nesting under all of those, you know, flat rocks and, um, you know, uh, construction debris maybe that's sitting there. We kind of move that around, look under it and see what's there. You know, you've got flower pots back here, over there as well. Um, you know, check out those areas, you know, there might be easy areas to treat where you've got an ant colony, you know, hiding out. Look for the honeydew producers. So here, you know, you got some scale insects. You got an ant right here. These guys are tending them. There's another ant over here, trailing along here. Uh, those are actually acrobat ants on this um, hibiscus. Uh, you can see them here, you know, on some of the, uh, the buds as well. But again, a good food source for those ants, uh, and they will tend uh, scale, aphids, you name it, any of those honeydew producers. Um, granular applications. Uh, you know, I do like some of these. Uh, because you know, they do get, you know, depending on what the carrier is, they can get good penetration down into mulch areas or thicker uh, thatch areas. Um, and um, you know, provide a little bit more residual down in there sometimes. Can get pretty good consistency as well, uh, as long as you're calibrated properly on your spreaders. Um, sometimes improved efficacy. Uh, if you do get granular products on hardscapes, so sidewalks, things like that, you do have to sweep those off for the most part. Uh, most labels will say, don't leave them there. You don't want them running off of there. You don't want them to be out in the open where, you know, pets or kids can you know, pick them up and, and play with them. So um, just do that as a good practice. And it's also you know, per the label. So you don't want to, you know, have an inspector come out and see granulars laying on a driveway. Probably not a good look for you and could potentially be cited for that. Um, so this one, you know, a little exercise, you know, just to kind of get your mind thinking a little bit, <clears throat> let's say this is a home, you know, it's 40 feet by 20 feet. So how many linear feet around this are you treating? Um, you know, it's kind of a, a an interesting question, uh, you know, uh, looking at it, you may think, you know, we're going to go seven feet wide here, um, uh, around this structure. So it's 20, 20, 40, and 40, um, by seven. So it's 840 square feet which kind of thinks like you're doing that, but you're really not doing that. You're actually doing something that looks like this. So you're going seven feet out from this corner, not all the way out to here. So, you know, not that it's a big deal, but, you know, it, it can impact, you know, maybe what you put on a service ticket. So what you're really doing in this scenario is treating something like this. And this is kind of like a, a high school geometry nightmare, right? Uh, but really it's just this seven foot by 20 here, seven foot by 40 there two sides that are equal like that so you just times that by two plus this equals really a full circle with a seven foot uh, radius so gives you that total you know that you're really going to be treating there um, and really the only reason this makes any sense you know if you run into you know someone who's uh, a regulator coming out and maybe they want to check what you're doing and you're only allowed to do seven feet out and you say you did so many square feet and maybe it's too much where this way it kind of gets you that more exact kind of uh, kind of numbers. So just things to think about, you know, when you're out there treating and making sure you do have the right uh, calibration and really doing the right things. Um, you know, safety is always important as well, doing any kind of perimeter pest control. I'm gonna go over a checklist here at the end, but you know, look for all these types of things, you know, ponds, pets, pet bowls, open windows. Um, but before we get into that uh, quick, uh, again, it's my pitfall checklist. A little bit on dust and aerosols, you know, these things can be concentrated around pipe chases, voids, cracks and crevices. Um, you, know, you can use them as contact uh, treatment or flushing of ants to see, you know, what's going on in, in a certain area. Um, look for areas like this, so any kind of penetrations going in. Uh, I'd say if they're, you know, any kind of electrical wires, you definitely don't want to use, you know, uh, any kind of a, a liquid or water-based type aerosols going into those. Maybe a good place for a dust instead of an aerosol. And quickly on habitat modification, um, obviously remove food sources, you know, clean up the sanitation. Um, 
control these other, you know, um, aphid scale, mealybugs, you know, honeydew producers, reduce the moisture sources, which favor ants, so leaky spigots, you know, clogged gutters, things like that. Um, and then, you know, potential harbored sites, you know, adjacent to the structure. So there's a lot of patio stones or, you know, pieces of wood laying around, you know, clean up those as best you can. And, um, you know, that's definitely gonna help. So I love this, this picture. This was something that um, I had sent to me, you know, they were having some issues here, um, but what's the issue here, right? So you look up here in the gutters, there's actually plants growing out of the gutters on this house. You can see, you know, all this, you know, molding or mildewing around the gutter systems you know, onto the shutters coming over. So what's happening is these gutters are completely clogged. Um, things are growing in them. Water is pouring over the gutters, coming down, probably causing some, some rot or, or water issues up here in the soffits uh, and to the uh, fascia boards, I'm sure. So I call this, you know, um, gutter gardening. You know, it's, it's a sign of poor moisture management. Uh, you've got harbors up there for ants, for mosquito larva development, or any number of, of other pests. So again, things like that need to be cleaned up. Uh, tree limbs, you know, touching the structure. You can do a great treatment around the base of the foundation. And say this tree here is, you know, 12 feet away from the structure. Here you have these limbs coming down onto the roof. You only treat it out, you know, seven to 10 feet. Nothing to stop ants from climbing this tree, coming down, getting onto the structure, avoiding your treatment completely, getting inside the house. So um, again, these type, types of things can be can be cleaned up and trimmed back. Um, some of the pitfalls, you know, this is a kind of a a very important thing to me. You know, I, I handle a lot of the calls that come into FMC. You know, Lauren does as well. Um, from from you know homeowners, from end users, from you guys, the professionals, uh, from regulators. Um, but walk the property before starting any treatment. You want to identify, are there any fish ponds there? Because you don't want to treat over a fish pond. Um, bird baths, pet food, pets, people, open windows, you know, open wells, believe it or not, there's still some of those out there. Uh, toys, whether they're kid toys, pet toys, uh, tripping hazards, uh, vegetable gardens, uh, and I'll say herb gardens as well. Uh, herb gardens are one that I get calls on quite a bit where, you know, I get the homeowner calls me and says, hey, they used your product out here. They treated over my herb garden. They didn't know it was there. So what do you do in those cases? Um, most times you're replacing an herb garden for that customer. Um, vegetable garden, same thing. You know, just ask those questions before you treat. You know, is there any you know, herb gardens, vegetable gardens, anything out here like that? Um, a lot of times with the herbs, you can't, they look like weeds, you know, right? They don't look like herbs. Um, make sure you're at the correct address. Um, I get several calls a year. I actually had a guy walk up to my front door I'd say about a couple months ago, I watch him. He's spraying the side of the house. He's coming up. Hey, I'm here to do your service. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have you for my service. And uh, he was like, oh, sorry, wrong address. Well, he had sprayed half the house coming up. Um, so again, make sure you do, do uh, you know, note these things. You know, it's easier to take care of beforehand than after you treat. Um, I think that's, that's it for me. Thank you for, you know, all the attendees. Thank you to Ed. Thank you to Brian for a great presentation. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.